Well, we've had a bunch of sermons about worship, uh, thankfulness, and all kinds of other things. And as I listened to these sermons, I wasn't here for most of them, but I got to listen to them, like so many others, uh, in the recordings. And um, it struck me as I was listening to all those sermons that they culminated in something very, very special. We hit at it last week, and we talked about it the last time I spoke a little bit, and that's fellowship. Fellowship is something that's incredibly important to our Father, our Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The biggest reason they have done all this, all that is, is because they want to share themselves with others. You know, and I was looking at that word fellowship, and it struck me what it means. You know, if you look at Webster's, it tells you that um, fellowship is a companionship or friendly association, a mutual sharing of experience, act, of, of uh, activity, of interest. And that's all per Webster. And that's our English definition of fellowship. And so I, I got to thinking about, well, is fellowship actually in Scripture? We know that it is here and there. So I looked it up just for fun in my two favorite versions, the King James and the New Living Bible. And in the King James, you find it there about six times. That's how many times you find the word translated into fellowship. Now in the New Living, I found it interesting that it's 24 times. And most of them are in the New Testament. I found that very interesting. So I thought to myself, okay, let's take a look at the words. There's five different words in the Greek and Hebrew and the different languages of the Bible that are translated into fellowship. And so I started to look at those, and of those five, three are a little bit different. Two mean pretty much the same thing as some of the others. So I just picked uh, three of them to kind of give us an idea of what this word meant in Scripture. In Psalms 94.20, in the Hebrew translation, it means to join, literally or figuratively, Specifically, by means of spells, to fascinate, to charm, or be a charmer, be a compact, couple as in together, have fellowship with, heap up, join self, or join together, or a league. I find that interesting because if you read Psalm 94 in the King James, I'm only going to read the part um, that uses the word fellowship. It says, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law. Okay, that's a whole section of scripture where God is talking about people who lie, cheat, steal, and do that kind of stuff, and what's going to happen if uh, they continue doing that kind of a thing. But it's interesting that it uses that word um, fellowship. Now, if you look at it in the New Living, it said, can unjust leaders claim that God is on their side? Leaders who permit injustice by their laws. It's kind of interesting that the word that they use, fellowship, can be translated on my side. In fellowship, God is on our side. So I find that that particular translation of fellowship shows us a part of our fellowship with the Father. God is on our side. We must never ever forget that. The second one that I took was Leviticus 6.2. And the original meaning of the word here is with open hands. I'm thinking about that. Wow, yeah, God does. He accepts us with open hands. His heart wide open, nothing concealed. He wants you. It's just like when the prodigal son came home. Dad jumped up and with open arms. He went running after that son to meet him. Same kind of thing. Our Father wants us with open hands. Jesus wants us with open hands. The Holy Spirit wants us with open hands. We are much wanted. So in, uh, in the Hebrew, let me find my spot here. Um, it's, uh, we're dealing with... Um, more trespass. If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbors in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in the things taken away by violence. 
And then it goes on to say, if you lie, cheat, and steal from each other, you'll go off into punishment of some kind. But, but that's not what we're after here. And the New Living says, suppose some of the people sin against the Lord by falsely telling their neighbors that an, an item entrusted to their safekeeping has been stolen. So again, it's um, us doing, it's, it's people having a relationship here. You had a relationship with this person, but yet you stole something from them. You know, God is not that way. God is not going to steal something from them, but not with open hands, not with open arms. God loves us dearly. And the second one, the last one was uh, 1 Corinthians 6.14. Uh, the word translated fellowship means to share or participate. God wants to share himself with us, and he wants us to share us with him. He wants to participate in our lives, and he wants us to participate in their lives. Those are just some of the meanings of fellowship. And our fellowship with the Father is an amazing, amazing thing. But there was a common thread that ran through those that I noticed when I was uh, praying about it. And that common thread is voluntary interaction and it's mutual. We're not forced. We don't have to. It's not demanded of us. And it's voluntary. God does it and we do it because we want to. It's something that is done not out of being forced to. It's something that's done out of being wanted to. So what does it mean to be in fellowship with Father, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit? God, in his wisdom, has not given us mass amounts of laws to follow. He's pretty much given us two. And we all know what those are. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So one of the things that I've noticed with these three different slightly different translations of the word fellowship is that you have to be honest with God. You have to be, well, you don't have to be. He wants you to be honest with Him. He wants you to tell it the way it is. He wants you to come to Him and be, quote, buddy, buddy. Where you go, He goes. Where He goes, you go. God, I don't believe that God runs every molecule of my life. He has given me guidelines. My son, this is where I want you to go. And as long as you go within this, things will go well. My job is to preach the gospel. Everybody's job is to preach the gospel. Whether you preach it with your mouth or you preach it with your actions. We are to preach Jesus wherever we go. That's what we do. That's one of the things we're called for. But how that is done, a lot of times, is up to us. We all have great strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes it's our weakness that preaches the loudest. By not doing certain things. Somebody knew that you were this and that and the other, but now you don't do this, that and the other. They say, why not? I said, well, that's not what my Lord would have me do. That's not me anymore. I don't do that. Don't you struggle with it? Every day of my life. But I'm learning new things. I'm learning a new way. I'm not going to go the old way. I'm not going to have fellowship with Satan anymore. Because that's what we had before. The Father looked at us and pulled us out of that mess. Unfortunately for some of us, we still fellowship with Satan a little bit. And that's, God's good with that. Because from every time we do something in that vein, He teaches us something does good for someone. We grow. We become stronger. Our relationship with the Father becomes more loving because He's always gentle and kind with us. We are His children. One of the things that I've noticed is that when a person becomes converted, there's a first love. God uses that first love to balance us out. 
when someone is in that first love, they are open to all kinds of spiritual suggestions. They will believe almost anything they're told. They will study and they will work and they will do and grow and they get a balance, which is because for their whole lives, they've been fellowshipping with Satan. In that first love, they find out what it's like to fellowship with God. And that first love is so strong for most of us that it carries us through our whole lives. We remember what that was like the day we found out that we're not going to die. That we're not going to die for what we've done. That we are totally and completely forgiven. And that the Most High God really does exist. He really did send Jesus. He really did send the Holy Spirit. I really do have the Holy Spirit now. I really am saved. I will live forever with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's an amazing time for us Christians. And it's something that we need to hold on to and never forget. That was the beginning of our fellowship with the God of the universe. We became his child that day. Literally his child. You know, as the great commandment goes on, it talks about loving uh, others. How do we treat others? You know, how do we treat the Father? Do we treat Him with love, kindness, and consideration? Well, how do we treat other people? There's something that goes on in our churches all around the world, and it's something that God has given us an answer to. It's in Scripture. And that is, we get so tied to our traditions in Christianity, our beliefs are so strong that many of us are unwilling to consider that we might be wrong. And the problem with that is, it's okay not to consider that you might be wrong. It's the way you treat the person who might dare to suggest that you might be wrong. to me. You're wrong. That's not what uh, the scripture says. Scripture says, be like the Bereans. Go home and prove it right. Or wrong. But your intention is to prove it right. What do you say to that person that you don't agree with? Well, you don't have to be mean and nasty to them. All you have to do is say, well, I'm not so sure. Um, let me go home and study that. I'll get back to you. See, the, the cool thing about that is, if they're right, you get to be corrected. And with that correction, I almost guarantee you there's a pyramid that's going to fall. Because usually, people don't challenge a peripheral out there belief. It's usually a cornerstone type belief. That's what happened to WCG. We had our cornerstone jerked out from under us, and everything collapsed. And two things happened. Either people accepted it and relearned everything, or they went off, stuffed it back in there, glued it together, and said, well, this is going to be our cornerstone anyways. And just went on. Either way, God loves them. Either way, they will end up in the kingdom. But it's a harder road to hoe. So as we're considering how we treat our brethren, especially... Are we kind and are we gentle? Do we say, oh, this guy's a real pest. I don't want to be around him. Do we consider him to be a friend or her a friend? Do we look deep into their soul and see that they're suffering horribly and that's why the way they are? Do we try to help them? Do we try to be kind and gentle? Feed them? Sometimes it's a spiritual feeding. Sometimes it's, it's okay. God loves you. It will work out. Trust him. Have faith. Have belief, have hope, have love, have joy, have peace. You have the Holy Spirit. All of those attributes are yours to be taken. Just take them. And this is the one that I have a hard, 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 hard time with. Love yourself. Have any of you seen the movie The Medicine Man? It's a green movie about saving the rainforest. But anyways, there's a, a scene in that movie where he's talking about 
a man that came to the rainforest and found aspirin. But in his rush to find aspirin, he brought disease. And that disease wiped out thousands and thousands and thousands of low local people. And he's talking to this young woman who is his assistant and she's telling him it's okay, you don't have to feel bad about that. And he makes a statement, he says, I don't think they knew it was me. And as the show goes on, they, just, they keep coming back to this. And finally it comes back to him and she says to him, your wife left you, but she forgave you. He says to her, no, she left me because I would not allow her to forgive me. Nobody can forgive me until I forgive me. How many of us live our lives that way? We won't allow God or anyone to forgive us until we forgive ourselves for some perceived horrendous, horrible sin. There is no horrendous, horrible sin that cannot be forgiven. And I'm afraid that some of us used that as a way to not grow. As long as I stay in this sin, I don't have to go the pain of growing. I don't have to admit that I've been wrong about stuff. I don't have to, I don't have to. But God says, love yourself. I have given you my son. He was worth more than every sin, a billion times over, infinite times over. His value to the Father was infinite. There was nothing or no one more valuable to him than the Son. And he willingly, with an open heart, gave him to go through all that pain and misery that he went through so that we can all be forgiven. Because the Father loves us dearly and he wants to forgive us. He wants us to accept that forgiveness and to live our lives accordingly. So in our fellowship with the Father, He wants us to be honest with Him. He wants us to be honest with our neighbors. He wants us to be honest with ourselves. He wants us to love our neighbors, love ourselves, love Him. He wants us to spend time with Him. He wants us to break that fellowship with the evil one. He wants us to spend much, much time with Him, always. Who do you go to when there's a problem? Oh man, I got this problem, how am I going to fix it? Or is it, that's going to the other side. It's, Lord, I have a problem. How do you want me to fix this? What do I do? How can I fix this? Can I fix this? Is it something that I must just live with? I got dumb. I was riding my motorcycle too fast in the bushes. I crashed. My legs all smashed up. Can it be fixed? Or am I going to live this for the rest of my life? He might heal it, might send you to a surgeon who can fix it, but then again it might be, no, you got to live with that the rest of your life. You're going to limp. It's just the way it is. And as you limp, you'll remember that foolishness. And when you go to do something, you'll think, hmm, maybe I should think about this before I do it. It's the same thing with the Father. If we go immediately to Him when we do something dumb, or we commit a sin, or we put ourselves out there where we shouldn't and say, okay, Father, what do I do? How do I fix this? He might, who knows, he may just fix it. He might say, well, this is going to be a long, drawn-out affair because you've got some lessons to learn. But we will fix it in the end. I need you to forgive yourself, my son. And this is how we're going to learn to do it. I'm going to allow things to get so bad that it is easier to forgive yourself than not. And sometimes that's what it takes. We are sometimes our own worst enemies. And God is standing with his hand outstretched, just waiting for you to take it. Always outstretched. No matter what kind of filth you're in, or how smelly you've gotten, or how damaged you've gotten, or how much you've cursed him, his hand is always there. It's like the footprints in the sand. If there's only one footprint, that's because he's carrying you. Things have gotten really bad. Fellowship with the Father is something that starts from the moment you accept Jesus as your Savior. That's not true. It starts from the moment you're born. 
God the Father is with every one of His children everywhere, always. However, our starting to fellowship with the Father lots of times starts when the Father calls us and introduces us to His Son. And then something happens to a human being. Either they go, wow, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. That hole that has been in my soul is filled. I feel contented. I feel at ease. I feel like I'm somebody now. I'm something. I'm going somewhere. And that's, of course, the Holy Spirit and God. And then when you do that, and you look at the Father and put your hand out, and He takes it, your fellowship is in full swing. Look at Him. Don't look back. Always look at the one who's holding your hand. And He will lead you. And He will guide you. And He will make changes in you. And you know, the song says, Your will, your way. The Father is wanting it to be our will, our way. He wants you to make His ways your ways. So that you do that because that's what you are. That's who you are. You don't want to do something else. You want to do what the Father has always known will make you happy. Whatever that is. And that's living the life of love. That's being kind and gentle. That's not putting yourself forward. If somebody offends you, so what? They didn't offend me. They're offending God. Because if I think like God, and I'm offended, it can God be offended? I honestly don't think so. I think we make God too much of an ogre. I think God smiles and laughs far more than he's upset. I think he looks at some of the antics that we go and he goes, Hey son, watch this. He's about to do it again. <laughs> there he goes. Told you. Okay, this is what we're going to do to help not do this again. And he goes through this whole plan to save us, to change us, to grow us. You know, it's been said that if God's not correcting you, if God's not helping you grow, then you're not his son or daughter. Every minute and every day, God never ever stops. He never lets down. He never ceases. He doesn't have to sleep. He can handle 8 billion people all at once. He can handle 100 trillion people all at once. After all, he's God. There's nothing he can't do. You know, as I listen to all those sermons that we had, wonderful sermons. You guys, I've got to commend you. You did an excellent job on every single one of them. Stuck right to the point, went right through it, made great sense, scripturally correct. We did a, you guys did a great job. It came down to, when I was reading through, it was an article by Joe Dukash that these all kind of stemmed out of. I was reading, it said fellowship. But it was interesting, he never said anything about fellowship in that little section. And it got me to thinking, that's, that's interesting. That's very profound, what he did there. I want you to read the little bit that he wrote. And this is very small, so I might stumble a little bit. It is by faith that we have a fruitful relationship with God, fellowship with God. It is by faith that we pray, fellowship with God. By faith that we worship, fellowship with God. By faith we have, we hear his words in sermons and fellowship. Faith enables us to have fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is by faith that we are enabled to give our allegiance to God through our Savior Jesus Christ by means of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. It is by faith that we, have, we can love other people. Faith frees us from fear of incident of ridicule and rejection. We can love others without worrying about what they will do to us because we trust in Christ to reward us generously. Through faith in God, we can be generous with others. Through faith in God, we can put Him first in our lives. When we believe God is as good as He says He is, then we will treasure Him above all else. And, will, and, and be willing to make the sacrifices that are asked of us. He will we will trust Him. And it is by that trust that we will experience the joys of salvation. 
Christian life is, from first to last, a matter of trusting God. And fellowship teaches us that trust. If we put all of our hopes in Jesus, all of our hopes and faith in the Father, if we struggle and know that no matter what's going on, the end will be good. That God has it under control. I tell that to Edward every day I talk to him. Edward Swaz is an older member of our congregation who's now living in a retirement center, and he's doing quite well. You can all be very, very proud of him. He's being the greatest example that I've ever seen him be. He's quiet. He's contented. He lets them do whatever they have to do. He does everything he can to make it work. He doesn't say, oh, it's not going to work. He says, I'm going to make it work. I will do what I have to do to make it work. It will work. And when it's working, it will be good. So pray for Ed that his finances allow him to stay because he's in a very good place. The people that the Lord is putting with are fine, upstanding men and women, and they care about the people they're helping. Really, truly care. And that's wonderful. So the faith that we use, is it our faith? I don't think so. I think it's Jesus' faith. Is the faith that we have. If you have Jesus' faith, you never question God. You do what He wants. Because that's what you want to do. The Father never asked Jesus to do anything that Jesus didn't want to do. Why? Because the three were one. They were in agreement with everything before this even began. Now people like to say, well, why did Jesus, uh, while he was getting ready to go to the cross, ask, Jesus to ask the Father to get out of it? I think that was an example for us that we can be deadly honest with the Father. Now we don't know what he said all those hours of praying. We just know the gist of it was, if there's any way that this can pass for me for now, let it be. And God Father said, no, and Jesus says, let's get her done. Okay? So when we have something that we think or know the Father wants us to do, and we want to do it differently or some other way, God wants us to let him know how we feel about it. And who knows? He does say that sometimes he will change his mind. Sometimes he won't. But the key is, is that we love him above all else. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And that means fellowship with him. Fellowship with Jesus. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Trust them. You know, there are stories that we hear about groups of Christians who have great miracles done in their congregations. Mass healings. Um, food showing up. All kinds of things. I guarantee you, when we get to talk to these folks, we'll find out that they truly believed. With all their heart, mind, and soul, they truly believed that they had the Holy Spirit in them, as the song said, that's the power that did all this stuff. And we have that power in us. And if we believe, truly, truly believe, and we believe that that power can do anything, and there's a time when what we do with that power would further the kingdom. The Holy Spirit would do it without thought. But the problem is, in our country, because Satan is so strong here, we don't believe in that. What do you see on TV and movies? Magic. It's not God. It's magic. There's only magic in the world is God. The Holy Spirit is the only power that can actually do stuff what we would say magically. Possibly Satan and demons, maybe a little bit if God allows it. But it's not their power, it's God's power. What about all the perverted television shows? There's not a single new show on TV that's not perverted in some way or another. Pushing agendas that are designed by Satan himself, I believe, to have us fellowship with him, and if we won't fellowship him, to punish us. You're not politically correct when you say that. You're evil. We're, we're running into a situation in our country that you can't say anything that doesn't agree with the politically correct folks. You can't do that. It bothers me. 
You know, like on our college campuses, our children have been taught that they are more important than anything else. If what you say bothers me, then you can't say that. Unless you go to the I can say anything spot. You have to go to the I can say anything spot. You can't say it where you are. So remember, fellowship with God is an incredibly marvelous thing. It's something that goes on and on and on. It's something that's voluntary. It's something that you want to do. It's something that as you hold God's hand and walk in the sand, it gets better and better and better. And as God walks you, He walks you farther and farther away from fellowship with Satan. You begin to see how foul our country is becoming. Not just the United States, but the world. I was watching a show the other day, and I saw some commercials for a BBC show. I couldn't believe the stuff they were showing. You gotta be kidding. You call yourselves Christian, and yet you play all this stuff? It's horrible. It's degrading. It's totally against everything our God preaches and teaches. We don't have the right to tell God how to be. We have the right to become like Him. That's our God-given right. Now, does that mean you go out and make a pester yourself everywhere? Well, no. But when asked, you answer. Some people are talking about some horrid stuff. I don't agree with that. I think it's bad. But don't let them think they're bad. Because that's one thing I'm thoroughly convinced. Most of this, Satan is using guilt to get people to be the way they are. Don't tell me I'm guilty. I don't want to feel guilt. You know what? If you keep making me feel guilt, I'm going to kill you. And that's what's coming. People are going to rise up. You know, there's a scripture that talks about kids will turn in their parents. That might not be too far away, depending on who gets into power in the, in the different countries in the world. But if we stay close to God, if we worship Him in the way He needs, to, He wants to be worshipped, because that's how we want to worship Him, if we are thankful always, so we can see His hand in everything, thank Him for everything, because everything is His hand. Everything good comes from the Father. Everything bad comes from Satan. But God takes all the bad and makes something good. Look what He did with Job. Satan tore Job said, next to death. God taught him some wonderful lessons and gave it all back and more. So if we find ourselves in a Job situation, be like Job. Sit tight. Hold on to your fellowship with the Father, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Pray. Worship. Sing songs. Be thankful. Realize that it, it's like, um, I don't know how many of you knew um, Oh, come on, brain. Uh, Lynn Bailey. He just passed away suddenly from a heart attack. As a human being, I'm sad because I won't get to see him anymore. But as a Christian, I'm full of joy. I mean, he's been promoted. He's done. He doesn't have to fight Satan anymore. However, he doesn't get to grow anymore either. At this, in, in a human state. But he's with God now. In whatever form that takes, he's with God. He's done. I mean, he's a dance in the dance, the jig, man. I made it. I'm here. I have stayed the course. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for keeping me in your heart, in your home, in your hands, holding on to me and carrying me and getting me here. I'm so happy. I'm just so happy. There's no sadness in him. And so that's why when we deal with death, it's okay to mourn, but remember, that person, if they were a Christian, they're done. They're there. I mean, they've made it. They're eternal. They will live forever. They don't have to fight Satan anymore because he's out of their picture. They've made their choice.